Okay, so I've been getting a lot of questions about um, microwave flasks. Uh, microwave is catching on, folks. If you haven't already uh, caught the wave, uh, you really should look into it further. There's plenty of research out there. And uh, to back up claims, uh, mine and other people's claims, uh, and I can only give you my anecdotal research, uh, my anecdotal observations, but the fact of the matter is that uh, microwave uh, curing is here to stay, and uh, it's a really great way to do things. With that being said, I wanted to touch on the, um, the components or the flask itself a bit, because there has been some buzz about flasks because people have used them in the past and had certain experiences with them. I also want to show you a couple of things that I do in order to make the process uh, easier and to give your products or give your materials, your equipment a little better uh, way to work and a better longevity as well. So with that being said, you know, I know um, I'm no newbie to this technology, have probably been curing with microwave with other products other than the one I'm using now for about four years. Um, I've tried all the different flask systems. Here's one, and here's another one. And then of course there's the GC flask system, which is the GC FRP flask, which is, stands for Fiber Reinforced Plastic. So that tells you right there that it's made of plastic, it may be fiber reinforced, but there is some care that must be taken with these in order to get them to uh, last. Uh, I'm going to share that with you now. Uh, first off, my reason for choosing this flask over the other flasks that are offered is the fact that uh, the, the recommended compression of the flask under pressure is greater than the other flasks that are on the market. For instance, this flask here, which is offered, uh, is a uh, microwave flask, but it's actually very thin, and it's not very robust, and it can only take about 200 PSI. In fact, the man in the manufacturer's instructions, it actually reads that uh, not recommended for over 200 PSI. So... Uh, with that being said, that's a really lousy compression um, strength, and I would prefer to pack press my cases at a higher compression. Uh, it's the same thing with this flask as well um, in that regard. With the FRP flask, I've had, uh, well, I've been uh, pressing these at 1,000 PSI for my trial packing, and then, of course, up to 2,000 for my final closure and then tightening of the flask. Um, there is a plate that you can purchase. I don't use the plate, but you can purchase a plate, a metal plate, that goes on top of this as an extra, as an extra component, which would protect the top surface of your flask. In 18 months, I haven't had any issues, so um, I just really didn't feel the need to purchase it. Also that piece of metal that sits on top of that flask also takes up a bit more height. If you don't have a lot of room to slide your flask underneath your compress, and the older compresses don't, don't allow it, I'm talking about the flask compresses, uh, you know, the um, hydraulic presses or the pneumatic presses, there's a lot, a lot of times not enough room under there. And I have a Mistra uh, hydraulic, uh, which is oil, and uh, it has a pumping handle, and it has a center plate, and I can screw it down uh, to, to get it to snug down before I pump up the pressure, and the, and the space, and I'll show you in a second, uh, is adequate for me to get it on the top of the flask. Anyways, with that being said, there are some things that I do with uh, my flask to make it a little bit more user-friendly. Uh, one of the things I just alluded to was that when I screw down my... Uh, my uh, my uh, plunger on the compress. Um, I'm always concerned about the nuts and the centering of that center plunger, uh, compression plunger, uh, on the top of the flask. So what I did was I put the nuts on uh, when I first got the flasks, and then I took a black magic marker and drew around it when I had 
a freedom of rotation on the, the three nuts uh, at the same time. This way, I'm assured that when I lower it down and center it on top of this, I'm not wasting a bunch of time trying to get it centered so I can tighten each nut. It, say, it saves me a minute or two just in the application of the pressure. And of course, you know your resins are beginning to set up at that point. Uh, when you start to think about pressing and so um, a, a minute or two is precious time involved in the process of of pack pressing uh, so I draw that on there when it's centered that black line is actually on the outside of the plunger so that buys me the time the space that I need here also when you are when you are putting the nuts on the nuts have a flat side and they have a rounded top make sure that you always put the flat side Against the flat, uh, against the flask. You don't want the rounded side on. You want the, you want the flat side against the flask. Okay, on the on the hole. Okay. Another thing that I recognized or realized when I started using this flask was that the design of the access holes were in reverse. They're conical in this regard. Let me see if I got a. They're conical in this regard. So if you can see that, and what that is is, this was the hole and this is the flask, they taper outward from the inside and they become tapered narrow at the top. What that means is that the lid comes off rather easy even when the stone is set up because there's no way to lock the cap on. So what I did was I just ground on the, li on the lip on the outside of the flask so that it's wider at the top and narrower at the bottom. If you can see that. I don't know if you can see that or not, but I just want to make sure you see that. So see, it's wider up here and it's narrower down here. Well, that's what I did here. What I, what I did here was I did this. I, uh, I don't know if you can see it, but I, I opened it up wide here. All I did is just took a carbide, took a carbide and just went like this on the outside so that it's wider out here. That way when the stone comes through and I'm pouring through that hole, the stone comes through, it comes through the top, and then once it's level with the top of the flask uh, and sets up, it locks the lid on and the lid won't pop off for any reason. Okay, that's another thing that I did with it. Let me see, some other considerations. Well, uh, I make my life easy uh, with the manipulation of the flasks because on the reverse side, there is these locking locking angles where the where when the the nut is uh, or when the bolt is placed uh, it won't rotate but it's kind of cumbersome to handle I've kind of gotten figured it out by grabbing two of these at the same time in this if I need to transport it around before I put the nuts on but what I actually did to make my life even easier is once I once I uh, started to realize I was going to have some issues here I just got myself a um, piece of plastic. Actually, if you've visited my YouTube channel before, this piece of plexiglass is the same piece of plexiglass I use for my Wonderfill material when I'm basing out and boxing my models. But I put some rubber feet on so that they stand off the countertop so that I can pick it up rather easily without having to have to pry my finger on it to get it off the counter. But it's a great way to uh, manipulate this and move it around before you get the nuts on about the flasking tie -up procedure, um, uh, some things to be aware of is that the actual, uh, it's a three-part flask, but the actual, the actual secondary part, the middle part, it's a little narrow in here, and you have to be very careful that when you're flasking uh, you're in your microwave that it's below the line, obviously, because you're going to get to put, you've still got to put a lid on it, okay? So, a very co be very cognizant of let me get a little something here if if this is the land area you want that land area to be nearly parallel if not a little below which will allow the the, the length of the teeth to fall under the fall under this part of the this top part of the second part of the flask okay so just be aware of that, you know. Uh, nothing worse than having the stone set up and then you go to put the secondary part on and the teeth are above it because you'll never get the lid on with that, okay? So uh, that, that's another issue. Obviously the same techniques uh, are involved with uh, the actual stone investing of the lower end. 
uh, making sure that it's all smooth and that there's a junction between the stone itself and the edge of the flask, that there's no undercuts that once you've poured your secondary pour that uh, once it's set up that it locks it in place and you can't get it apart. Um, so, you know, those rules still apply. I take a sponge with a little scotch bright on the other side and basically always smooth that out a bit. Uh, that tends to work really well for me. Um, and then before I pour my secondary coat, I use the uh, Co Super Sep, which is a, a great material. It's clear, it soaks in, and I'll put that on the surface before I put my, I usually put two coats, put that on my surface of my stone all the way around the land areas before I pour my secondary pour and what that does is once that sets up and I go to do a, a, a light heating of the mold in order to separate it no stone sticks to the secondary pour. So anyways this gets this is a little primer to get you started with these flasks uh, and then uh, we'll go from there. Something else I wanted to mention however before I move on to the other parts of this is that you know one of the major complaints or issues that people had in the past with microwave flasks was that they always complained that the bolts uh, broke uh, or they snapped and so they ended up taking and uh, substituting those bolts for galvanized nuts and bolts which is fine it'll work but I can give you an easier way to do it without having to uh, switch out your nuts and bolts and that is that people are under this misnomer uh, with these flasks and that is that the time to put the nuts on is when it's under compression in your in your press. In other words when you have it at 2000 psi and you're holding it for a second or two, a minute or two, a minute, what you want to make sure you do is at that point while it's under pressure take and turn the nuts with your fingers, finger tight, just finger tight, just like that. That's all you really need to do because if you take it out from the press and then you try to tighten the nuts, what are you doing? What you're doing is you're trying to compress the flask and the, and the acrylic in the inside by tightening the nuts and of course you're going to over tighten them and then they're going to fail because they are fiber reinforced plastic. So my recommendation and the way I do it and it works extremely well is that while it's under pressure with the flask compress that's when I finger tighten again like I said like that and if I really am compelled uh, that when I take the pressure off if they're still loose which they won't be I would take a number 19 millimeter wrench. I like an open-ended box wrench or uh, an open-ended wrench and take and I will tweak it like a 64th. I mean not hardly even just a, a tweak but you won't need to because what happens is that when you take the pressure off of this flask when the nuts are on and you take the pressure off there's a there's a very small amount of rebound because these are again fiber reinforced plastic and when they rebound they'll literally cinch these nuts up and they will not turn. At that point it's it's ready to rock. I mean you take it out. The nice thing is it's not like our conventional uh, resins where if we pressed it in a flask uh, in a press and then we, we'd have to take the pressure off and then take it out and put it in a flask compress between the taking the pressure off and putting it back in a flask compress it's actually opening a little bit. You're going to close it back again with with the double flask compress but the the point is that you've taken the pressure off the initial final closure. Uh, with my Mistra system and, and you should look into that system it's kinda cool they've got a compress that's that has two bolts and a bar one on the top and one on the bottom and while it's under pressure this would be for my conventional flasks uh, I can literally tighten the two nuts and that will hold that in that final packing compression uh, pressure so that when I take the pressure off my flask compress or off my off my uh, flask press um, it maintains the pressure that was on there for my final closure. Again, you know, uh, we're removing a bit of uh, we're moving a bit of error every time we don't have to open or take pressure off that flask. All right. With that being said, we've kind of had our general overview of these flasks. Give you a couple of neat little tips on how to maintain them.
I'll just put a little Vaseline on the inside when you're done and cleaned them up. Uh, you really don't have to. They will separate because it's really smooth and shiny plastic, but if you feel the need, you can coat it with some uh, Vaseline. Um, and that's about it. So I gave you a couple hints on that, and hopefully you'll come back when I comprise the next video, which will give you the actual packing procedure, state of material, and so forth. Uh, and I'm talking about the state of the GC Nature Krill MC material. Again, stop for, uh, thanks for stopping by. Tom Zaleski here. I'll talk to you later.